Hey, everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Well, today we have an amazing success story of HOPE, which stands for Healing on Purpose Every Day. My guest is Rachel Nichols, Eccles, excuse me, I don't know why I'm so nervous, Rachel Eccles, and she lost nearly 100 pounds, 90 to be exact, on a plant-based diet, and she's going to share her story with us. Please welcome Rachel to the show. It's so nice to meet you. It's so nice to meet you. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, I just love your story. It's, I mean, I like, because, you know, we're gearing up for our next year's Truth About Weight Loss Summit. And when when people not only lose weight, but do it successfully, sustainably, healthfully like you and keep it off, I think you have the potential to inspire so many people. So I'd love Thank to hear you. your story. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, I'd love to tell everyone my story and hopefully just share some of what makes, you know, can help you be successful doing this. Right. And, and, and I know you, you have a Facebook group and I'm imagining you're helping thousands of people with their I story. do. Yeah, I, I had so many people messaging me that um, I just I, and I didn't have time to respond to everyone in person. So I just decided to start a Facebook group and I don't sell anything or, you know, I'm not like promoting anything. I'm just sharing what works for me and trying to encourage people. So, well, that's, that's wonderful. And we have the link below in what's called the show notes. People can click and join your group. Right. Please do. I'd love to have everyone. Nice. Thank you. Well, if you want to tell us your story, we are all ears. All right. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. All righty. Can you see that? It's perfect. Okay. All right. So the title of my presentation is Hope Healthy on Purpose Every Day. And that's really what I'm striving to be is through my choices to be purposeful every day about my health. So I grew up eating the standard American diet like most people. And I was always thin and and felt like I didn't really have to worry about my weight until I got married and started having kids. And I guess that's when it hits most of us. But even though I was thin when I was younger, I was never fit. I never felt really healthy or fit. I was just thin. And once I got married and started having kids and my weight became a problem, um, I just really struggled with it. And over the years, I became a sugar addict, a food addict. I was an emotional eater. Um, I could not resist anything in the house if it was sweet. And my husband would bring treats home and hide them from me because he knew while he was gone at work during the day and I was home with the kids, he'd get home and he'd go, where's my whatever. And I had eaten all of it. It it would not remain if I was, if I knew it was there. So I overate on a regular basis and I eventually became obese. So here's the first picture of me that I'm sharing. This picture was taken in about 2017 and my BMI was about 38, very close to 38 when that picture was taken. So, and you know, it really bothered me being overweight and then obese. Um, I didn't like it, but it really ran in my family. Um, And so did problems with food. My siblings and my parents all struggled with their weight. All four of my grandparents growing up were overweight from what, you know, my memory of them was. Um, Almost all of my 14 aunts and uncles are overweight or were overweight. And then there was the chronic disease, mostly diabetes, just diabetes everywhere. My mom was a type two diabetic by the time I was 11 or 12. That's, uh, you know, my memory of it. My dad developed it. My siblings even became diabetic in their twenties, if you can believe it. And one of my grandparents was diabetic and then other diseases in the family, heart disease, stroke, Alzheimer's, And then my mother um, developed Parkinson's disease, heart failure, Graves disease. And then there's also breast cancer, pancreatic cancer, fatty liver disease that have all made appearances in my very close family. Um, And I have at least three cousins that have, uh, three first cousins that have thyroid cancer. So I really like this from the book Atomic Habits. It says, we don't choose our earliest habits, we imitate them. We follow the script handed down by our friends and family, our church or school. And in many ways, these social norms are the invisible rules that guide our behavior, 
each day. And that's how I felt. I didn't know anything but what I was, you know, raised like, and I just did what everybody else did. And so I was down the path to having all the problems everyone else did. Um, and that's just how things were because I didn't know any different. And at one point I really felt like I had no control over whether I would succumb to these problems, especially diabetes. I figured it was just a matter of time. Um, I thought it was your weight, your genetics, and your age that all determine diabetes. <laughs> and I just thought, well, the only one of those I can control is my weight. And I'm not even, you know, handling that part of it. So, but I was really searching for answers. I did want answers. Um, identifying the pattern is awareness. Choosing not to repeat the cycle is growth. And I really didn't want to repeat the cycle, but I just didn't have any answers. Um, so I kind of felt like my whole adult life, I had been looking for a way to be healthy and trim without obsessing like about every bite, every calorie, or being obsessive about exercise. And over the years, I tried many diets and none of them were sustainable or healthy. I always felt deprived and I returned to my food addictions, my emotional eating. Um, at one point back in like 2010, I lost 58 pounds and got down to what I considered was my goal weight. <laughs> And I couldn't even stay there for a month. I mean, every day was just clinging on with my fingernails, you know what I mean, to uh, not um, reverting back. And I was just hungry all the time and I couldn't sustain that. And so eventually I just fell off and I regained it all back plus more. And this, that thought leads me to this slide, which is don't focus on your goals. Instead, focus on your habits that will take you to them. It's always you versus you. And I think I've really found that out is that the more you're focusing on that goal weight or, you know, keeping off those pounds or getting off those pounds, then you really aren't very happy. But if you focus on the habits that get you there, then you can eventually see your goals come into sight. And then you don't feel like you're just hanging on, you know, it's a lifestyle, focus on your habits. Um, so anyway, I finally decided um, that I wasn't going to diet anymore. And I, I hope you don't mind bringing my faith into this, but I really started praying for an answer. And I felt like God had an answer for me. I just didn't know what it was. And I figured that if I was patient and really searched that somehow he'd make it known to me. So um, I decided that the yo-yo dieting was harming me more than hurt or hurting me more than um, helping me. And I decided just not to do it anymore until I figured out a sustainable, healthy way to do it. So I prayed and I waited for eight years, no dieting. And during that time, I went to grad school and I gained another 35 pounds while I was in grad school. It was so stressful. And then at um, age 46, after finishing that, um, my BMI was almost 38, that picture that I showed you, um, my cholesterol was 260. I felt awful. I looked awful. Um, I had switched to a new doctor and she actually recommended a whole food plant-based diet to me. And, uh, you know, before starting me on a statin or anything like that. And I, I honestly didn't know what a whole food plant-based diet was. She gave me some paperwork to take home, read these books, watch these movies, you know, educate yourself. And I watched Forks Over Knives and had a total life-changing moment, of an epiphany really. And without any doubt whatsoever, I absolutely knew that this was the answer that I'd been praying for. You can almost always start with something you can do and move up as you get stronger in fitness and in life. And I just, I didn't really know where to start, but I knew I had to start because I'd been waiting all this time for this answer and I knew it was it. So I jumped in and my conviction was really so strong that all the obstacles and stuff that, that came into my way, I just kind of pushed them aside. I just powered through them. Um, and I had to transition on my own without any family support. As a matter of fact, some of my family members were oppositional um, and angry. Um, and I think some of them probably thought that all the things we used to do that we enjoyed food together, you know, if there was food involved in any way, we would never, ever again, enjoy any of those things. And um, I, I'm sure that 
they just, because they hadn't been through the experiences I had that had brought me to this point, they didn't understand, but I just wasn't going to mess it up because I'd waited too long. So repeat after me, I'm allowed to do what's best for me, even if it upsets other people. And I just knew I had to stick with it no matter what. You got to do this for you. This is for you. This isn't about anybody but you. Live for you. And that's how I felt. So I remember feeling like I had spent my whole life taking care of everybody else but me. My kids were grown and out of the house. And now it was my turn to take care of me. And my stubbornness and my determination got me through those early days and weeks when I didn't really know what I was doing, but I just knew I had to start now. And so this really, I totally feel this. It says, if I waited until I had all my ducks in a row, I'd never get across the street. Sometimes you just have to gather up what you've got and make a run for it. And that's what I did. I just, I figured it out as I went along. So it took me about three days to become about 95% whole food plant-based. I read everything I could get my eyes on about the lifestyle. And as my knowledge grew, grew, then I was able to like cut out the oil and the stuff that was the other 5% that I just didn't have any clue about. I started feeling better within days. The weight started to just melt off. And about six weeks after I started, I went to lunch with a friend and obviously she was like, what are you ordering? <laughs> I think we went to Panera and had salads. And um, I told her about what I had been doing. And um, she just jumped on the bandwagon with me. Like I told her about it. And the next time I saw her, she was on board <laughs> and she was a really good friend. And our families got together a lot. So having her on my side at these family get togethers, having somebody else that was eating like me was so great. And it really took the pressure off of me. Um, maybe the journey isn't so much about becoming anything. Maybe it's about unbecoming everything that isn't really you. So you can be who you were meant to be in the first place. And I really feel like, feel that that's true for me. Um, and this life change just made so much of a difference for me in a lot of other areas of my life too. But one hard thing that happened was about eight weeks after I started this, um, and I was still struggling a little bit, um, my mom passed away unexpectedly. And with only eight weeks behind me on this, this really could have been the point where I just fell off. <laughs> you know, a previous emotional eater and all that. I had to fly out west for the funeral and actually had gotten my ticket all squared away and was ready to go out in a few days when my dad ended up in the emergency room. And I had to change my flights and get on a, a flight right now and get out there and help him. And I had to stay with my in-laws who had no clue about what I was doing and are very, um, they show their love through food. And so I knew I, I just was kind of over my head with all of that. Um, but I did know that I had already started seeing these amazing results and I felt so much better that I absolutely couldn't fall off. I knew that if I fell off, I probably wasn't going to be able to get back on, or maybe I wouldn't be able to get back on. So I clung to it like my life depended on it and stuck with it hundred percent during the whole ordeal of the funeral and all of that stuff. And I was able to get through the experience knowing that I don't need to rely on food for comfort. I don't need to rely on food when I'm emotionally stressed. Self-control is not the ability to say no to bad things. Self-control is the ability to say yes to something so completely that all other options are eliminated. And eating healthy gets easier when you turn, I can't have that into, I don't want that. And even though I'd been addicted to all those foods that I used to love, I really didn't want them anymore. And that made a big difference for me. So during the next 20 months, I lost 90 pounds and my cholesterol dropped over hundred points from 260 to 155. I did have a four month period in there where I stopped losing weight. I plateaued and I had to make some tweaks. And, and I'll talk about that later. But the other things that big differences I saw is that my uh, health just improved. My migraines became infrequent. And previous to this, I was having migraines two or three times a, a week. Um, I was having them a lot. I was taking a lot of medications for them. I started sleeping better. My snoring stopped as the weight came off. 
I had more energy than I had in a long time. And my skin started to look amazing. As a matter of fact, people started saying, what have you done? Your skin looks amazing. Um, people told me I was reverse aging and that I was glowing. And so now I just feel like this is just the natural way to be. This is just the natural, easy, joyful way for me to be alive. And um, next month is my four year anniversary and I'm definitely never going back to what I was doing before. I really like this slide. Um, the little guy at the top says, what are you throwing away? And the other little guy says, oh, just some old ideas and beliefs that were taking up too much space. Some of them say ugly, too short, failure, over emotional, not good enough. And I feel like all of that was just getting thrown away from me. I was just getting rid of all those old doubts and stuff. First, it is an intention, then a behavior, then a habit, then a practice and then second nature. And then it is simply who you are. Here's another before and after shot. Um, the before shot was taken uh, right before I graduated from pharmacy school. And um, again, that's when my BMI was about 38. On the right is um, about the time my weight loss stopped, um, 90 pounds. And my BMI is now about 23. Here's another before and after shot. And then this is the one people always kind of freak out about. <laughs> I mean, and neither one of these pictures has been altered in any way. The one on the left was taken with a DSLR and the one on the right was just a cell phone. But look at the difference in my skin and also, you know, just all the weight around my face. Um, so I've been maintaining for over two years now, and even though I have never been an athlete and I've never really liked exercise, I do it pretty much every day now. And although I started with just walking around the block, because that's really all I felt like doing. Um, and when I plateaued, I had to switch up some exercise stuff, but most of this weight was lost on just walking. So, um, but now I do strength training, I do yoga, I still walk, it's my favorite exercise. And I recently started running and I really find it amazing what I can do as someone who's not genetically gifted in the athletic department. Cause even when I was a young thin person, I was not an athlete. I didn't like to run or you know play sports. And so um, just a couple months ago in October, um, you know, which is just a few months before my 50th birthday, I ran my first half marathon. And I never even thought that I was capable of achieving a half marathon, even back when I was in my prime. So um, I, my finishing pace was under just barely under 11 minutes per mile. And I did this all with minimal training because I only signed up nine weeks before the race. And then six weeks before the race, I fell and hurt my hip and wasn't able to run. And I took four weeks off and was just told that you shouldn't run this race. You're not going to be able to do it. So I'd kind of given up. And then two weeks before the race with four weeks off, I started running again and um, just decided to go for it. And so, and I did it without any problem. So I honestly feel like I'm in the best physical shape of my life right now. And I'm turning 50 next month. So here's, here's another before picture. And then a picture of me at the end of the marathon, half marathon going for the finish line. <laughs> um, and these are the kind of foods that powered my half marathon race and that I've been eating for the last four years. Just very colorful, vibrant stuff. Um, and, you know, a lot of times I eat really simply just potatoes and steamed vegetables. And, um, and sometimes I'll make, you know, something a little fancier, but I am always 100% oil free unless something sneaks in I don't know about. Um, and I, I got from chef AJ that I did eat vegetables for breakfast. And nowadays I, I eat pretty much a 50, 50 plate for breakfast. I always have like a big side of steamed vegetables, usually, um, usually broccoli in the morning, just cause I like broccoli, <laughs> but sometimes asparagus or green beans or something else. Um, anyway, I still remember how it felt to be in that old body and you know, the way I looked. And with, I know with my previous food addictions that letting, letting things slip is not an option for me. Um, we all know that addictions don't just disappear. I 
I mean, I sometimes feel like eating this way has fixed all the problems I ever used to have with food. Um, but I know that they're still there under the surface. This slide says, we know now that when you awaken the sleeping dragon of addiction, it becomes stronger, more powerful, and twice as deadly as before. So I just know I, I can't go back and I never want to go back. So uh, this is also by James Clear, who wrote the book Atomic Habits. Um, he says, one good day does not mean you can coast tomorrow. You never have it fully licked. Making good choices is an endless process. Many areas of life that we value most, our relationships, our fitness, our craft, require a continual commitment. So also there's a huge mental component to this. I know because we live in this world where there's toxic food everywhere and it's totally socially acceptable to eat crap, but people you know, give you a hard time when you're trying to be healthy, um, you, really, you really need to take control of the mind to do this. And to me, I think that people need positive affirmations and positive self-talk. And you need to believe that you're worth it and if you don't, you need to pretend that you believe that you're worth it or, you know, kind of like fake it until you make it. It helps to see yourself as the new you before it ever even happens and picture it every single day because there's power in that. We cannot shame ourselves into change. We can only love ourselves into evolution. And it's not what you say to everyone else that determines your life. It's what you whisper to yourself that has the greatest power. Also, we need to remember it's not about being perfect. It's about effort. When you bring that effort every single day, that's where transformation happens. That's how change occurs. So there's going to be days when you don't have 100% to give, and that's totally okay. You give what you can, but you didn't give up on the effort. And then the next day, hopefully you can pick up wherever you, know, you might have left off the day before, but you always bring that effort. So I highly recommend the book Atomic Habits by James Clear, um, especially for those of you like me who might not be able to maintain a perfectly clean environment at home because family members are bringing stuff into the house. And even if you talk to them, maybe they're not supportive. Um, maybe they're bringing stuff into the house and you can't control that part of it. That doesn't mean that you're doomed to fail. But what you do need to do is shape an environment that will help you succeed despite it being imperfect. And so whatever it is that's giving you a hang up, you've got to figure out a way around it. And there's tons of ways to, you know, figure out a way around it. I really like how um, James Clare talks about in his book, um, depending on the way you think about yourself really can determine your success or not. So if someone is trying to quit smoking, and someone asks them if they want a cigarette, there's you know, a couple different answers. They could say, no, thank you, I'm trying to quit. Or they could change their total view about themselves and they could say, no, thank you, I don't smoke. So um, the way you think about yourself and all the mental um, affor positive affirmations really make a difference. And you need to think about yourself as being successful. This is a quote from him. He says, the people with the best self-control are typically the ones who need to use it the least. It's easier to practice self-restraint when you don't have to use it very often. Disciplined people are better at structuring their lives in a way that does not require heroic willpower and self-control. In other words, they spend less time in tempting situations. And that's where you really need to figure out a way to control your environment, even when there are things that are out of your control. You can structure it for your success. Um, and that kind of leads me to bringing up two things that might seem to be unfortunate circumstances for myself that have actually blessed me. Um, the first one is not having family on board. And that sounds like, you know, sometimes I think I'm so jealous of all those people have family on board, but it actually blessed my life to not have them on board. And the reason why is because I'm sure that, um, my husband in particular probably just thought this was another phase, another diet, another fad, and I was eventually going to abandon it like I did all the others, and I was going to fail. But for me, I was so determined that this was going to work because I knew it was exactly the solution that I needed. I got really stubborn, and I decided that 
he wasn't going to be right. I was. And that was part of what helped me stay on track all the time. Even if he wasn't in the house and he wasn't watching what I was eating, I wasn't going to let him be right about this because I knew I was right. So every time you cheat, and it doesn't matter whether they're watching you or not, every time you cheat, your family or your friends or whoever that finds out about it or who sees you, they're going to expect you to do it again. They're going to be like, well, why did you eat that thing this other time? And now I'm offering you this and you're not going to eat, you know, they're just going to keep offering it to you. They're going to think it's okay for you to cheat. So just don't. And um, like I say, you aren't doomed to fail just because you might be the only one in your family. Just figure out how to cope with each challenge as it comes along and be so absolutely committed and determined because being wishy-washy is not a strong enough commitment to get you through the hard times that um, might come. You have to be stubborn, be resolute, be committed. And then the second way that I feel like I'm sort of lucky despite an unfortunate circumstance is the genetics in my family. Um, I, I know that the genetics in my family don't allow me or anyone else to eat the standard American diet or the SAD diet and be healthy. I mean, there might be some people who can eat the standard American diet and be thin, but I still think that they're ill on the inside. Um, but in any case, my family, I can't get away with that. Um, the obesity and the diabetes is just everywhere. And, and so that actually ended up being a motivating factor for me to know that I needed to change and that this was my answer and I need to do this long-term. It's not a diet, it's not a temporary fix. It's a lifelong plan for optimal health. So just having the genetics that I do, even though it's unfortunate, has actually helped me. Oh, uh, one reason people resist change is because they focus on what they have to give up instead of that, what they have to gain. And we are what we repeatedly do. Excellence then is not an act, but a habit. And to reach a goal you have never before attained, you must do things you have never before done. So if what you're doing, what you've, how you've been living your life, your entire life is making you sick or overweight, or you have chronic disease or whatever it is, you need to change things up. Whatever you've been doing isn't working and you've got to do something. So how do you begin? First of all, you have to make a decision and you have to commit. And the other big thing that is just huge is you need to find your why. I had a life-changing moment. I had my why and it was so huge and so emotional and so all-encompassing that it helped keep me on track. If you cannot be wishy-washy. You have to find some big emotional why. And you also need to remember that you and you alone are responsible for your own self-care. You cannot blame this on anyone in your family for not supporting you or whatever. It's your choice. So I recommend people start with Dr. McDougall's starch solution plan. It is the very best place to start. And I feel like because he, you always want to try to get rid of the oil, but if there's a little salt or a little sugar to help you learn to like the foods, um, that is what he promotes. And it's the best way to make this drastic change and make it so that you can do it. You can stick with it. It's not too hard. Don't restrict calories. Don't count calories. Don't restrict certain types of plant foods at first. Just get rid of all those animal products. Just stay on it and figure it out. And as soon as your taste buds start to adjust and you get accustomed to the food, then you can tweak stuff if you need to go SOS free and get rid of the salt and all the sugar, that's fine. But just don't make the changes so fast. I feel like I made my changes really fast, but most of the people that I see aren't able to do that. They've got to do it um, maybe stepwise or figure out a way to make it really manageable. So, and a lot of people jump in a little too fast with calorie restrictions and intermittent fasting and a five or five or an eight hour eating window and calories and, and SOS free. And like, I've got to exercise seven days a week and excessively. You can't do that. It's, it's so overwhelming that it won't stick. So just start and start with McDougal's starch solution. It is, you can get the book. It's the best thing ever. And remember that some people are over planners and they're planning to start their plant-based diet for like years. <laughs> Don't do that. 
just jump in with whatever you know now and start. Stop wishing and start doing. And remember that all if all you can do is crawl, start crawling. Pick one small thing, like maybe just breakfast to start with. Rome wasn't built in a day, but they are laying bricks every hour. You don't have to build everything you want today. Just lay a brick. You just got to start somewhere. A big misconception is that you need to be motivated to get rolling. Well, you don't. Research shows that motivation often follows action, not the other way around. So in practice, you don't need to feel good to get going. You need to get going to give yourself a chance at feeling good. And that is me in a nutshell. I didn't feel good. Walking around the block was all I could do when I started. And, but that's enough. You just need to get going. And in six months, you will have either six months of excuses or six months of progress. So the choice is yours, start today. And then also remember that you're gonna hit some obstacles and setbacks. I mentioned that I hit a plateau. Um, uh, I'm trying to think, I plateaued for four months and at the end of that four months uh, was my one year mark. So I guess it was eight months. I was losing weight for eight months and then I stalled for four months. And I thought, well, I'll just ride this out. I'll keep doing what I'm doing. I'll keep losing weight. But after being stuck for four months, you kind of know that you're not going to lose anymore unless you change something. So that's when um, I decided to tweak both my exercise and what was going in my mouth. And I got an email on New Year's Day from the McDougal program um, offering to let people join the maximum weight loss thread on his forums. And they have a weekly, like, virtual weigh-in where you can be accountable for what you've been doing during the week and say if you've lost weight and um, they have helpful and supportive moderators on there and it's completely free. So I joined that um, after I'd been on this plateau and then I also upped my exercise. I started walking further and longer and then I also added strength training to my regimen. And between the two of those, that did it. That got me off my plateau. I knew I was at least 20 pounds overweight still. And I started losing again, but it was slow. And, you know, I tweaked both my food and my exercise. And I lost about 30 more pounds in 10 months. And if you divide that out, that is three pounds a month. That is not fast at all. So we're talking about consistency is what it really came down to. And I really don't know if I would have been able to follow the maximum weight loss program so closely without that online support. And it really made the difference. It made me feel like I wasn't uh, deprived cutting out even more foods than I already had. Cause at first I was kind of resistant to doing that, but it really, really worked. But just remember that sometimes you're going to have to have, you're going to have setbacks and you might need to tweak stuff. Giving up on your goal because of one setback is like slashing your other three tires because you got a flat. Don't do that. <laughs> Just keep going. You got to uh, keep trying. And this is a quote from Usain Bolt. Um, he said, I trained four years to run nine seconds and people give up when they don't see results in two months. <laughs> and sometimes, you know, we, we are tempted to give up because we are testing our willpower to the maximum that we can test it at the same time that we feel deprived. And then we step on the scale and we don't see any results. And that's when we're tempted to give up. And that's when you need to go back and concentrate more on your habits that you're building rather than the goals. And smaller steps are really important. If we want to get somewhere, sometimes we've got to divvy it up into small manageable bits. So um, one thing I wanted to just talk about is the mental strategies. You know, there's not very many of us who haven't been tempted to do something that we know is morally wrong. <laughs> and why is it that we don't actually go out and act on those temptations? It's because we control our thoughts and we know we shouldn't do it. And I don't really see any difference between doing that and playing those same mind games with yourself when it's something that you don't want to eat. So there's a huge mental component to this. And, um, Controlling your thoughts is really, really important. And there's all sorts of mind tricks you can use to stay the course and control your thoughts. And I did this right from the beginning. I didn't really know I was doing it, but 
Um, I collected a lot of these cute little slides like I've been showing you, and I had a whole folder on my phone with these motivational topics. And when I felt a little tempted, I would take a deep breath and stop, and I would open my, up my phone and flip through these. That really helps. Another thing you can do is find a mantra, like something that you repeat over and over and over to yourself that you believe deeply in that will help you. Another thing that you can do is when you're looking at a food that is something you don't want to eat, you can actually train your mind to have a certain word come to mind. So if you're looking at candy or if you're looking at the hot dog or the hamburger or the pizza or whatever it is, um, you know, whatever word you can come up with to associate with those pictures, every time you see it, you'll think of it. And then when you turn and look at the brightly colored, you know, beautiful plant foods, you can think of another word and you can come up with anything you want. But like, for example, when you look at the standard American diet or candy or whatever it is, you can think of poison or you can think of what it's doing to your arteries or whatever. And you, if you say that word that you come up with every single time you look at it and then turn away, that's how you control your thoughts. And um, like I say, we all do it with other things. We control our thoughts with other things that we know we shouldn't be doing. And you can just transfer that to this. And it's a skill that you have to build up, but it's something that you can work on and definitely um, get better at, and it will help you stay the course. Now, most of all, remember to enjoy the journey, express self-love and have patience with yourself. When you feel overwhelmed, take it one thought, one step, one day at a time. And self-love reminders, remember that you don't need to please everyone. It's okay to be a work in progress. You are strong, you are valuable, your true colors are beautiful. It's okay to have bad days and talk to yourself with kindness. And since we all love plants, take care of yourself like you would take care of a plant. Place yourself in a healthy environment. Hydrate and remember your nutrients. Get sunshine. Remove toxic people from your environment. Do what makes you bloom and be patient with yourself because good things take time. And then this is kind of like, I, I love this. I actually have a t-shirt that's got this on it. Um, I'm a monarch butterfly conservationist and I have a butterfly garden in my yard and watching this transformation of this little caterpillar, all he can really do is crawl and poop and eat. And then he becomes that. And I always think we have whatever we need inside of us to become what we want to fulfill our dreams. We just have to follow the path and we can do it. Um, but it does take time. One thing that's interesting about these before and after shots people always show is it's like, it, it's almost like the, the pictures are side by side. It's like, was I like that yesterday? And then all of a sudden the next day I turned into looking like that. That's just not how it works. Um, all big changes take time and it happens a little bit every day. And that's what you need to remember to just work on a little bit every day. And just to end, I have this really great quote from Chris Wark of Crispy Cancer. I'm sure a lot of you know who Chris Wark is. This is a quote from him. He said, raise your standards. You have permission to do anything you want and to eat anything you want, and you always will. No one is taking away your favorite foods. But if your favorite foods or habits are harmful to your health, your standards are too low. The pursuit of health isn't about what you can't do. It's about what you can do. Unhealthy choices should not be viewed as forbidden, but rather as things you don't want to do, things you choose not to do. Those things are beneath you now because you've raised your standards. You are worthy of the highest standards. Your mind, body, and spirit deserve the utmost love and care because you are a child of God. Your heavenly father loves you with an everlasting love. Your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit and you are the caretaker. Give your body the highest, whole, highest quality whole foods from the earth Give your body invigorating exercise six days a week. Give your body eight hours of rest each night and take every thought captive. Don't worry about the future. Give your worries and fears to the Lord. So I just really like that about how we deserve better and we can choose better. So that's the end of my presentation. And I will stop screen sharing so I can see Chef AJ again here. Well, Rachel, that was such an inspirational, wonderful presentation. I had no idea you were going to do that. Oh, well, 
I figured I should put something together. I had so many thoughts in my mind about, you know, just stuff I share on my website or on my Facebook page and stuff, just trying to encourage people that, because I see so many people that want to change, but they just don't know how. Right. You know, I want to read some nice comments from the chat. Bambi says, Rachel is an inspiration to me. I'm down 52 pounds. Congratulations, Bambi. Mary Beth says rock star. So a lot of people are just giving you lots of uh, love and just uh, thanks for this uh, wonderful presentation. You know, your quotes were incredible and you really got me to want to read the book Atomic Habits. I've read the book Tiny Habits by BJ Fogg, but now I have two audible credits and now I know it's going to be my next book because I'm curious, you had a quote. I'm wondering if this was yours because I wrote it down. Don't focus on your goals, focus on your habits that will take you to them. That is something I don't, I'm not sure if that exact quote was from the book, but that is, he has a whole chapter about that in his book. And um, I listened to that book on audible while I was walking on the treadmill last winter. And like, I just kept saying, where's a piece of paper? Like, I, I know some people are, um, they like to read a traditional book because, <laughs> but I, I ended up buying the hard copy because I need to mark it up just for me. Um, and I think it's going to be the first book that I read or listen to every single year at the new year, because it is so motivating. And there, I mean, it just blows you away. You have all these mind blowing moments while you're reading it, and then you can't implement them all at the same time. <laughs> so good. Right. Well, you know, you've motivated me to buy it as soon as we're off the air and listen to it because I love listening to books rather than reading them because I can do it while I'm on the spin bike, while I'm walking my dog, while I'm doing dishes. And it exactly. sounds phenomenal. Yeah. It reminds me of a lecture that Dr. Doug Lyle gives called The Slow Fast Way, where he basically says the same thing. You don't folk. You, so I love it. Thank you. And let me read some wonderful comments. Janet says you look beautiful. Jennifer says she is so inspirational. Susanna says stunning transformation takes one to no one. Um, you look so happy and healthy. You look so much younger. That's true. When I saw the two photos, especially of the face. I know. <laughs> I mean, that's it. That's incredible that, that this could make you look younger. It's crazy. I mean, I don't there's I had so many people just come up to me and go, what did you do? You know, <laughs> and just lots of compliments about my skin. Yeah, be it's beautiful. Cheryl says, what a great story of hope and inspiration. Um, and it, it, Christy says, you look like a cousin to yourself, not, not the same person. And so glad to hear that you feel great. And let's see, there's just so many wonderful comments. I don't, you know, I don't know if you ever heard this quote and it might be from Ho Dr. Howard Jacobson's book, but it's not, it was something like, it's not that people resist change, they resist being changed. Mm, that might be true. I mean, if we decide to do it ourselves instead of someone else changing us, you know, and he's didn't, isn't he the author of the book, Sick to Fit? Sick to Fit. And then he has a new one about how to change other people. I, I and I thought that was really interesting. Because okay. I have to give him some credit because um, I read Sick to Fit and he said something about People were meant to walk and people were meant to run. You were born to walk and born to run. And that's actually what motivated me to start running this year. I started running in May. And um, before that, I was just enjoying my five mile walks every day. And uh, when I read that, I was like, okay, I'm not built for this, but I'm going to start running. And then, it, like I say, then I thought I was going to do a 10 K in the fall is what kind of what I was thinking when I started running. And then one day I just went out and ran eight miles and I was like, well, that would be dumb to do a 10 K. So <laughs> that's when I was like, maybe I should do a half marathon. I, I wasn't sure I could do it, but, um, obviously it's the lifestyle. I mean, it's not like I all of a sudden became athletic because my genes changed or anything like it's, it's the you know, food. It's incredible, incredible story of hope. <laughs> yeah. and, it, and it just shows it's never too late because you were in your 40s. Yeah, I was 46 when I switched. Yep. I didn't lose my weight till I was 52. So I want people to know it's, I, mean, I had clients in their 90s. It's never too late unless you don't start. Amy's and look at sister. Esther Lovebridge. Yeah. Uh, oh my yeah. God. She's going to be on the show Saturday with Al. And she's, um, he, it's amazing. I, I love these stories. Amy says, I really appreciate Rachel's calm, practical, positive approach. She's a gem for all of us in the whole food plant-based community. And uh, I love her strong conviction, says Deborah. It's what helped her be so successful. She's a true inspiration. You know, um, 
I'm curious, who was, do you remember who the doctor was, who was the first one that, that offered you some lifestyle advice? I do. And she's not my doctor anymore because she left the practice and I haven't been able, there's nobody here in Cincinnati that takes insurance that um, is promoting it. Like I'm part of a group called plant uh, healthy plant-based Cincinnati. And um, we all talk about it. Who's your doctor? Who's your doctor? And we can, nobody can find one. Is is this doctor that you first encountered? Is she a plant-based doctor? Yeah. Yeah. She, I don't, I don't know if she like promotes it to everyone. I think it's a delicate balance sometimes when you work for somebody that, you know what I mean? Has the, the standard view that they were given in medical school. And, um, but yeah, she, she was eating plant-based and she was recommending it to a lot of her patients. And she obviously had all the handouts ready for me when I went and saw her. So, um, I'm, yeah, I am so indebted to her and I went back to her, you know, for a couple of years, um, before she left the practice and she saw, she knows what's happened to me. I think she said I was the only one of her patients who picked it up and took off and ran with it. <laughs> you know how you changed your life and the tremendous results you've had? Yep. She does. She does. Yeah. Well, and she's, um, I've, I've spoken to her a couple of times in the last few years, even after she left the practice. But, um, so my, my current doctor is very traditional. And when I first went and saw her, I just asked her if she could support me with my lifestyle. And she said, yes, as long as I don't have any nutritional deficiencies. Oh is what she told me. Yes, of course. You know how many <laughs> nutritional deficiencies. And, so eaters. she's seen my labs and stuff. She was the first time she saw my cholesterol level, she was actually looking through my medical record for where the statin was. And I said, I've never taken a statin. Um, so, you know, I don't know. So I'm trying to educate her, but it's slow, hard work is all I can say. Uh Well, I'd love to have your, the, for that doctor on the show and to thank her for what she's done for you because you're paying it forward. So One of the viewers is saying it, it, it's so hard to watch someone hurt themselves, you know, the people that are not willing to change, you know, loved ones, family, friends. Yes, I, I struggle with that. Um, I will tell you that my husband is extremely supportive now. He, I think at some point, like a switch kind of flipped and he decided that if I was going to stick with this, no matter what, that he better be supportive. <laughs> That he he decided to be supportive and he is very supportive now, but he's not on board himself. But I do see in so many ways that he's eating better. And part of it is because I'm not fixing junk and I'm not bringing junk into the house. Before it was a lot me, you know, that was doing it. He still brings stuff into the house, but um, he eats so much healthier now, especially at home, you know, than before. And it is difficult to watch somebody you love. Um, when they could be eating better and and healing some of these things. But, um, you know, I, I kind of figure it was me, the one that changed and not him. And he didn't have the experiences that I've had that brought me to that point of change. And every single person is on their own journey and uh, the best thing to do. And I probably didn't do a very good job of this at the beginning, but the very best thing to do is love them and be, be a good example and show them how it can be done. And then when they have the experiences that lead them to that point, then maybe they'll change. But until then, you know, I I didn't know any better either at one point. And so you just do your best. I love that you knew you had to save yourself. Yes. I mean, you, that is so true. You can't save anybody unless you save yourself. Right. It's like putting the oxygen mask on first. I'm just curious, does your husband have any, any medical problems that could be improved if he ate healthier? Oh, definitely. He does. He does. Um, and you know, I've actually seen some improvement, uh, with his, you know, medical issues and stuff just by the little bit I've been influencing him. So he, he even will tell people he's trying to cut back and, you know, he is, um, he just, he's not ready for that big step yet. And, but maybe someday he will be. Um, but in any case, it doesn't really matter to me. I figured out how to make my life work with it. And we, we accommodate each other. Um, One thing I share with people a lot that ask me, how do you manage the environment in your house when there's, you know, both types of eating? And so I've shared this a lot, um, but we have a calendar, like a blank calendar that we put on the refrigerator 
and we take turns cooking. So one week is his week to cook and the next week is mine. That's because we both work full time. And so we might as well share, you know, cooking duties. But what we use the blank calendar for is when it's our week to cook, we write out what the plan is for dinner each night. And that way, if the other person doesn't want to eat what we're making, then they know what's on the, on the menu and then they can make what they want or tweak whatever's being fixed to get it the way they want. But we do make a lot of meals that can be made both ways. And neither one of us minds having an extra pan on the stove, you know, to keep them separate, you know, so that's how we manage it. And um, he, he likes to eat out. And so we eat out more than I would ever eat out on my own, but I go because I love him and he wants to go. And he's considerate likewise by always choosing a restaurant where I know I can get what I want. If he wants to visit another restaurant, he goes with coworkers or goes when I'm not with him. But when we're together, he always lets me have the choice of where I'd like to go. That's wonderful. I'm so happy yeah. to hear that. Because you said at the beginning, some of your family members were actually oppositional. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was mostly mostly my husband. <laughs> um, I, well, my mother-in-law didn't really get it. But um, yeah, and now, you know, it's, gee, it's been almost four years and like my daughter is eating this way now. She's lost almost 50 pounds. Um, I influenced one of my sisters to start eating this way and many friends and Facebook friends have started eating this way because of me. I, I tend to, now that I've got my own Facebook group, a lot of my posts that I would put on my personal page previous to that, I now just put in the group and I keep thinking I should post this on my page too, because a lot of my friends have come and joined my group because of the posts I was putting on my original page. But um, sometimes I don't post as much, but a lot of friends and stuff. And I, some of them come again and go like they follow it and then they fall off or whatever, but they always know that I'm here if they want support, you know? Yes. That's great. And you, you still, you have a real full-time job as a pharmacist too, right? I do. Yeah. I'm very, very busy. And that's one of the reasons why I started the group. I just had so many people messaging me because every once in a while I'll post my pictures or something on Well Your World or the Drudy family or, you know, Forks Over Knives. And so then I'll just get like barraged with all these messages and I don't even have time to talk to everybody. So that's why I started the group, you yeah. know, so I can that's answer everybody at once. <laughs> Yeah, good idea. Linda says a life-changing why is what has lessened my struggle since I began the whole food plant-based lifestyle. The why is what keeps me motivated and mindful. And you had a very, and have a very strong why. Yeah. I, I really think that you have to figure out your why. There's another um, really great book that I can recommend. It's not whole food, whole food plant-based, but um, it's by Pamela Peak and it's called um, Fitness body for life for women is what it's called. And if you just ignore the part about food, the middle chapter on the, she calls it mind, mouth and muscle. And if you really delve into her chapter about the mind, she has all sorts of good tips to find your why. And she talks about like the bullseye and, and how you can like narrow down in and, and find the bullseye about what's going to motivate you. It has to be very powerfully emotionally that something you can connect to that you can draw on the power of it when you need it. So that book is fantastic. Um, she also talks about muscle and has got pictures of simple strength training exercises you can do at home. There's just a photograph of a girl doing it and you just buy an in inexpensive set of weights and off you go. Um, so I love she Dr. Has she has a wonderful book on food addiction called The Hunger Fix. I've interviewed her for several summits. Do you oh, think okay. one of the reasons your husband is a little bit resistant is maybe he suffers from some food addictions? Oh, definitely. I think I think everybody who's eating the standard American diet is suffering from food addictions. I do. I mean, why else can you not give up a piece of chicken or a piece of cheese or whatever? Like it, that's what it is, but it's just so socially acceptable. And, you know, even, even the people who, well, I'll just say this, uh, the church that I belong to, we kind of have a health code and it's not, we're really good. The people in my church are really good at following the don'ts of the health code, but not so much the do's. And I think it's because we're just entrenched in our society. What's, you know, socially acceptable or whatever. And we just do it. 
Um, what we do what everybody else is doing and that's eating all of this stuff that's bad for us. And it affects how we take care of our families. You know, it affects our mental health. Um, it affects how we can serve other people in our community. It's just, it's, it's so important to get your own health under control so that you can, you know, do the other things that you want to do in your life and help other people. Yeah, uh, thank you. And uh, Cheryl says, this is a really great presentation. It makes me think that I can tell my story too. You know, um, just to change gears for a minute, you have a famous cinnamon roll recipe and I looked at it and I actually posted it in the show notes, even though you didn't ask me to, but I'm curious for someone like me that's allergic to wheat, is there a substitute? Well, that's a good question. I've never had a problem with gluten and I know a lot of people need to be gluten-free. So I don't have experience cooking gluten-free, but, and so, and because it's a yeast, you know, it's based on the yeast, <laughs> you know, I don't know without the gluten, if it would rise right or not, but like whenever I'm making something else that, you know, if it's rise, it doesn't need yeast or whatever, like oat flour, but there's a lot of great flowers. Um, uh, millet flower is lovely. Um, you know, quinoa, there's a lot of gluten-free flowers that you can try, but I don't know about the cinnamon rolls. I haven't tried it any other way. So I don't know that might Get be to a work, part. Rachel. I was like, <laughs> I'm not the rest. I borrow recipes from people and just make other people's recipes. I'm not a recipe queen. I like, I share lots, but like Brittany Giroudi would be the one to try to figure that out to me. Okay, well, thank Not you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, Kristen says, this is an amazing presentation. So good in her Facebook group is wonderful and informative too. And Susanna says she needs some of your slides printed off and taped to her fridge. I loved all your quotes. I don't do quotes, but I do these things. I don't know if you ever heard of them. They're called vision boards. Oh, that is cool. And, and I so haven't heard I of do this. I do one and New Year's Eve is coming up and I do a new one every December 31st instead of going out and being out with all the drunk drivers. And so those are, that's kind of like my way of yeah. having like what your quotes are. Well, and where I, do you, you have it right where I'm looking? Okay. So you hang them in your house somewhere? Yeah, or? I do. And sometimes I have several, like if I want to work on different things. And so throughout the year, anytime I see an inspirational quote or a picture in a magazine, I cut it out and put it in a folder. And then we do this with usually with friends. And we've been doing this for probably 10 years. And it's, it's very, it, it, I mean, it really does come true. Like I had a vision board years ago before I even met Dr. McDougal that I wanted to work with him. And I, I swear everything I put on the vision board comes true. That is so neat. I mean, I can just imagine like having a space in your home or something where you hung all that sort of thing. And whenever you felt discouraged or weak or whatever, like you could just go there and be in your zone, you know, yeah, and <laughs> you can put them everywhere. Like my, my um, a gentleman I work with, John Pierre has people put them on his clients, put them on the phone, on the fridge, everywhere, your bathroom mirror. So yeah. Yeah, it's I fantastic. actually was at the NHA conference this last summer and so got to see John Pierre. He was there. He's he's amazing. Yeah, he's in it. Yeah, he, he we call him also inspiration for it. So anyway, yeah. Myra says Rachel is awesome and very inspiring. There's just so many nice quotes. Well, let's see if I can read more. Great presentation, says Terry. And I'm seeing if there's any questions. Crystal says, I'm so glad I came here on here to see Rachel. And Randy says, all the wonderful guests I find and the dedication to doing it daily. Thank you. And thank you guys for watching. Uh, okay. Hey, you know, I, it's so funny. I, I was listening to a, a YouTube you did with the Vital Blend. And you said that I make, uh, I, I have a saying, if it's in your house, it's in your mouth. And basically that saying came from what I learned as a patient in True North when I was 50 pounds heavier. That was just my own vernacular. And you say that that, that gives people to, to give up hope. And I don't mean it for that. What I do for the reason I say that is because I learned from Dr. Lyle that well, what he says is we must work harder on our environment than we do ourselves. So what I try to get people to do is to try to negotiate a clean environment. Maybe there should be a second part of their saying. And it sounds to yeah. me like that's what you do is you teach them the workarounds. Yeah, I totally agree that it's it's so important to try to control your environment. But there is another option if someone else that you cannot force to do this is bringing stuff in. And each person's probably individual and has to work on it themselves. But I just want people know to know that it can be done. 
And as a matter of fact, there's, uh, you know, I'm obviously not the only one who's done this. I know you had um, Paul Chatlin on your show. He's done it um, himself. And I know that there's other, somebody else came to mind and I can't remember who it was, <laughs> but there are other people who've done it. And I, you know, I haven't like, you know, pulled out the information from those people, how they do it, but there are ways around it. But a lot of it to me is just controlling um, your thoughts, you know, and making sure it's not visible um, and getting it away or whatever. After you've been doing it for a while, though, I find that family members are more likely to, you know, cooperate and stuff. I, one day, somebody brought my husband some cinnamon rolls and he left them out on the kitchen table and um, I put them away. And several days later, he had forgotten about them. And he said, hey, where are those cinnamon rolls? And I said, I put them in the pantry. And he said, well, I forgot about them and they're probably stale now or whatever. And I was like, so I explained to him why. And he said, well, I thought that stuff didn't bother you anymore. And I, I just had to tell him, well, most of the time I don't let it bother me. Like it's part of, you know, how I approach my health. But that doesn't mean I need them sitting out on the kitchen table staring at me either it's better to put them away. And he's been a lot more cognizant of, of me wanting to put thing, his things away when he leaves them out. I, and I never ever resent him or me for, you know, you shouldn't ever resent taking care of yourself. So I think more when somebody's early in recovery, it's more crucial to have the cleanest mm -hmm. and they can. But one of the things I've seen with a lot of the women I've worked with, it's it's one thing if the person you live with absolutely says no, but sometimes the women, they won't even ask. They won't yeah. even ask, at least ask if, and see if, if there's a workaround before just assuming, you know? Yeah. And sometimes it takes being brutally honest with the people in your life, admitting that you're an addict. And that you don't want to be, you know, that you want to take care of this. And we, you know, we're, as women, we're the caregivers. And sometimes we figure that we have to take care of everything ourselves. And sometimes we can't, sometimes we have to ask somebody for help. And um, I am guilty of that as anybody else. So <laughs> I agree. You, you know, speak up, say what you need. Right. To tell, yep, absolutely. So Crystal says, I just turned 70 and I've lost 20 and I've lost 21 pounds on a whole food plant-based diet in the last 16 months. Congratulations. And Jane says, I didn't start till I was 61. I've lost 115 pounds in the last three oh years. Gosh. Rachel has been an inspiration to me. We got to thank that doctor. You got to introduce me because even if she doesn't come on the show, because she didn't realize, even though probably 99% of her patients aren't interested. Um, I mean, as long as you get one, you know, it, yeah, it, it, I'm sure she probably influenced other people as well. But part of the thing that um, made such a difference for me is that she was a doctor. You know, I mean, if when people are questioning you, well, my doctor told me to do this. But, you know, there's just not enough doctors out there that are recommending this. But for me, I mean, I, it really made a difference that she was recommending it. Not, not that I wouldn't have hopped on board otherwise, but I'm just saying, uh, you know, when my family, like extended family, when we went to my mom's funeral, you know, were questioning me about it. Well, I got to say my doctor recommended this. It made a difference for me. So. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll have to try to hook you up with her. <laughs> I, know. I mean, I just think, you know, like each one teach one. It's like, it's very, it's such a great, um, you know, I, I, so I love it that she did that for you, you know, because yeah. you just never know who's going to, who's going to bite. Right. And we need, we really need more doctors who are teaching this. We do. I'm, I've been so tempted to just bring like the starch solution and the China study <laughs> and give it to my current doctor because yeah. she really needs to, um, you know, renew her skills, <laughs> her knowledge. Yeah. Well, some, someone watching said that their gynecologist started eating this way after they had a tremendous weight loss and drop in cholesterol, you know, because your doctor, I think the new one didn't saw you after you already were losing weight or lost weight, right? Exactly. She just, <laughs> she can see my medical record, what I used to weigh and she can see what my cholesterol was, but she hadn't actually seen. Yeah. What I looked like. 
Yeah. I should so, tape a picture to the front of one of those books and give it to her. <laughs> yeah. You so you know you didn't start out with the maximum weight loss McDougal. You started mm-hmm. out with more like the regular, right? And then Starch you, solution, right? Yeah. And I think that's fantastic because you know I teach for the McDougal program now. I've been doing that for since the pandemic began, and what's kind of cool about it is it's like you know, you can always go back to start solution, you know, and you can go back and forth. It's like, you, mm-hmm. it's, it, it works really well for, so when people can, can feel like they can be less strict, they just go to regular start solution. If they feel they need to, you know, tighten the screws, they can go to maximum weight loss. I, that, yeah. I think that's, you know, you had mentioned the two books that you love the most. My two favorite books are the McDougal program for maximum weight loss and the pleasure trap. Yeah, I do have the pleasure trap and I've read that book as well. I've, I've got a whole collection of books just because I love reading that stuff. And uh, one of the recent books I've been reading is Undo It by Dean Ornish. Yep, I, and I've had some mind blowing, you know, just listening to it on Audible while I'm out walking and <clears throat> just, whoa, really like moments from reading that book, just so much good information. And it's a great way to keep up your motivation, you know, just delving into all that stuff. Well, if you uh, listen to The Pleasure Trap, you get to hear me. <laughs> oh, that's what I need to do. I need to get it on Audible. Yep, yep, yep. That was a that was a, a really hard book to do because there were words. I don't have to call the doctors. <laughs> I'm like, how do you pronounce this word? I don't, I've never heard of this word. It was so funny. I um, will definitely listen to that then. I was going to tell you that I also read your um, Secrets to Ultimate Weight Loss book. And I... I can't remember exactly when I read it, but it must have been either at the beginning of my plateau or, you know, somewhere in there. And at the time I thought I can't do that. Like it felt like it was taking away way more foods, but that's part of the thing is when you make these changes incrementally, you grow and change as, you know, that's why I don't recommend someone just jump. I mean, I know Esther jumped in with maximum weight loss, but like, I don't think that a lot of, uh, you know, average people could do that when they're battling, you know, the addictions and stuff. Um, but so it's funny because at the time I thought I, I just couldn't give that stuff up. And then, you know, but when I go back, it's like that and maximum weight loss are pretty much the same thing, aren't they? Absolutely. My book is for more end stage food addicts. You know, I always tell people do the least restrictive program they can do True. With the caveat that will get them the results that they seek. And like we mentioned before we logged on, I was saying, I can, is it, is it fair to say you lost nearly a hundred pounds? And you said, well, I'd like to lose 10 more for it to be a hundred. But then this idea of it's not always wise to go to your lowest attainable weight, but to your lowest sustainable weight. I love that. I love that. And, you know, I did, um, I did like a Mary's mini last summer for like 14 days and took off an additional four pounds in 14 days. But, um, I knew I couldn't eat Mary's mini for the rest of my life, especially living with somebody who wants to eat out. And you know what I mean? Like, and it didn't take long for the four pounds to come back, but what I'm doing now is very sustainable, you know, and I don't even weigh very often. I, I don't even weigh once a week. I go a lot by how my clothes feel. And, um, you know, I just, and I know if, if I go up a couple pounds or whatever, then I just eat a few more potatoes and a few more steamed vegetables and, you know, drop any tortillas or, or bread or whatever for a few weeks, you know what I'm saying? And then, but most of the time I eat very close to starch solution. Yeah. Well, I'm curious, knowing now what you know about the truth about health and what causes most diseases, what's it like being a pharmacist? Oh my goodness. It is the saddest thing ever. <laughs> I, I, um, am a pharmacist for, uh, I am basically a geriatric specialist. And so you can imagine all these older people are on way too many medications. And, you know, if they were just fed the right thing, that most of that would clear up. And it's very, very sad. (laughs) I, I think that's actually another thing that motivates me every day is to, because I don't want to end up like that. You know, I want to have my health in my old age. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's very sad to see all these people suffering needlessly from so much chronic disease that could be prevented. So, well, I, I know you've watched the show before, so I'm sure you know that every guest, even guests that aren't talking about health, even guests that aren't vegan, get the question, what do you eat in a day? Oh yeah. So I'll tell you like what I ate yesterday. And I, by the way, I post usually post, um, my food login pictures every day on my Facebook group, if you're curious, but 
Like, so yesterday I ate some millet that I cooked in the instant pot with cinnamon and uh, berries, raspberries, blueberries, and some almond milk on top. And then about a half a pound of steamed broccoli. And I like to dip it in no cheese sauce. You know, it's just one of those vegan things you whip up in your blender. Mine, uh, the one I use doesn't have any overt fats. It doesn't have any nuts or anything like that in it. It's uh, based on roasted red peppers and it's got some oats in it. But anyway, um, so that's what I ate for breakfast. Uh, most of the time for lunch, I'll have either just some raw veggies and hummus, or I'll make a big salad with some beans. I try to include some starch in there to make sure it fills me up till dinner. If I'm hungry, I have a snack. I usually, you know, sometimes I'll eat a banana or a clementine or, or something like that for a snack. If I'm hungrier than what a banana will fulfill or, you know, an apple, then sometimes I'll just eat a baked potato with ketchup out of the fridge for a snack. And then dinner, I make a wide variety of different things. Um, whole wheat pasta with marinara and mushrooms. Um, I, I make a lot of, you know, like fajitas and tacos, you know, with the lentil filling, um, lentil sloppy joes. Those are all things that we can make both ways in our household, you know, so that it's, we can both eat the same thing, but it's a little different for our preferences. Um, and yeah, so if you want to eat, see more of what I eat, um, like I say, I post it almost every day in my group just to show people that you can eat, you know, what you can eat. And then I put recipes. Nice. Your cheese sauce sounds fabulous. Is, and I don't like to eat overt fats myself. Is that recipe available on your page? It's actually Jill McKeever's uh, Jane, Game Changer Cheese Sauce. You've probably heard of that before. Sure. But yeah. And the reason why I picked that one is because it doesn't have any overt fats. <laughs> because I was, I was eating that on maximum weight loss, even though I guess technically, because you put it in the blender, the oats become flour. But, it, you know, that's a gray yeah. area. Yeah, no, but uh, to get me to eat like volume of steamed broccoli, you know what I mean? Like, I just like to dip it in that stuff. And that's, that's, you know, you got to find these little tweaks to help you stick with stuff, you know? Absolutely. You do. Here is a great question from Crystal. What's your favorite request at a restaurant? Um, well, we go to a lot of, uh, you know, ethnic restaurants, but like probably one of my favorite places to go is we have a little Thai place um, that I really like, and they'll make me a spring roll with no, you know, um, they leave out the shrimp for me. Um, so it's just got lettuce and peppers and avocado and cucumbers and stuff. And then it's got a peanut dipping sauce. And then they also have brown rice available. And then they'll make me a big uh, plate of vegetables, sauteed vegetables, and they do it oil free at my request. Um, as a matter of fact, the waitress knows us so well that one day I forgot to tell her, please don't do don't use oil. And she came back to the table and said, you want that no oil, right? So um, just vegetables, brown rice, and then the spring roll. That's one of my favorite places to eat out. But I can also get like um, oil free fajitas at a Mexican restaurant. Um, there's, you know, we go to Japanese and I'll get miso soup and a little side salad and a, and a veggie roll, stuff like that. That's great. Well, you really have figured this out. Do we see a book in your future? Uh, a couple of people have told me I should write a book, but I don't know if I have time or want to. <laughs> so I don't know. We'll see. Well, either way, you're helping people. You've got me to buy a book today. So I'm definitely the first thing. <laughs> Get that atomic yeah. habits. You know, it's, it's always been in like in the sphere. And I thought, well, I already read tiny habits, but you made it sound just so you're a great, great, you're a great book salesperson. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll have to read the one that you read. Yeah. Tiny habits. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, that's good too. I mean, they're all good. They're all good. And I and I I just love Audible. I get I get so much more reading done now that since Audible came oh. along. Oh, definitely. As a matter of fact, because of my my schedule with work and my exercise that I absolutely won't let drop, you know, I'm so devoted to my exercise that having audible and being able to listen while I exercise is the only way I can get some reading in. Do you work like in a, in a hospital? Setting? I don't, I, I don't, I actually travel. Um, I'm a consultant pharmacist. So I travel to nursing homes. I see. So, so it's not like you're working with the same people every day that saw your transformation. Nope. But I did recently this last summer go to a meeting where um, some of my coworkers that I normally see only once or twice a year 
um, saw me for the first time and yeah, <laughs> but wow. they, they didn't even say anything, but I could tell they wouldn't, I could tell they noticed. So <laughs> it was, it was kind of funny. All, right. Yeah. yeah. You know, I need I'm, to get a new badge because the picture on my old one is the old me. And I'm like, I hate that. I, I want a new yeah. picture. <laughs> you had mentioned that you might want to show a piece of clothing. Oh yeah. Yeah. I, I saved one pair of pants and actually all my other clothing. I very quickly gave it away as soon as I got thin enough to where it was too big for me. And the reason why I did that is because it was a commitment to myself that I was never going to need those clothes again. But I did save one pair of pants, so <laughs> I'll show you. We'll see if to see, see this chair. Wow, it, I bet two people could get in those. Yeah, and I, I'm wearing black, so I don't know if you can see me, but like. May I, I ask what's, may I ask what size those were? They're a 22. And it, I, I was wearing 22s and 24s at one point, but this is the only pair I saved and I can fit myself in one pant leg here. You should take a picture of that. That's adorable. You want to know something? You know, I had my picture um, done, my picture and an article in First for Women magazine. No. Yeah. Um, what's funny is Dr. Oz was on the front and I was down in the corner right below Dr. Oz and it was a weight loss story and they sent a professional photographer out to my house and a professional makeup artist. And um, I actually asked him to take a picture of me holding those pants and he did. And he never sent me the photo. And I've emailed him like twice and asked him for it. And he's never sent it to me. But um, I'll have my husband take a picture sometime of me holding those up because I've never actually even shown those to anybody. But it would they, be a great thumbnail for just this uh, this broadcast if you could do it. Uh, Teresa yeah. says the presentation was absolutely beautiful and I loved it and I'm going to rewatch it for sure. I'm curious, any of the people, like especially the ones that were oppositional at the beginning, have they like noticed like your tremendous success and maybe stopped being so oppositional? Oh, definitely, definitely. Um, my mother in law. <laughs> My mother in law sometimes will tell other members of the family that they need to lose weight <laughs> and they should come talk to me. Um, and she, she never really, she always believed that you needed meat and you needed milk, you know, to be healthy or whatever. And um, she, I, I don't think she believes that anymore. She is so proud of me. And like I say, sometimes she'll send other people, she'll say, you should go talk to Rachel, which means you need to lose weight. I'm not sure that's the best way to, you know, kindly help people lose weight, but anyway, so yeah, yeah, definitely. And I mean, just most people that I know, you know, have, of course, they all, they've all noticed, but a lot of them have come up to me and said stuff. So now I'm guessing that your mother-in-law is probably not overweight herself. If she's telling other people they need to lose weight. Uh, she's a little overweight, but you know what? She's 86 I'm thinking or anyway maybe not that old but but she's slowing down and um you know we we have had some really good conversations about this and I think I've gotten her thinking but she she's kind of at that point where she feels like she's not got a whole lot left do you know what I mean and she's just trying to man not got a whole lot of time left and she's just trying to manage what she can right now so I mean I don't think she would ever do it herself, but she, just the fact that she supports me. And when I go stay at her house now, I don't have to worry about hurting her feelings because I'm not eating her clam chowder or whatever. <laughs> do you know what I mean? You know, I almost feel like if you did write a book that, it, you know, not, you, you could focus on how to succeed in an unclean environment, you know, with, I think that would be a really great story to tell. That would be, that would be. And think about all the people that need this, because I just feel like there's so many people out there that just give up before they've even tried to start because they're like, oh, well, my circumstances won't permit that. I'm like, you're the one that determines, you know, there is a way around everything and you just have to figure it out and figure it out for your circumstance. Um, so yeah, that, that's an idea. I don't know. Maybe when I retire, I'll write a book. <laughs> yeah. Cause the thing is, is it's not that people can't succeed in an unclean environment. It's just that if they have a clean environment, it just makes it so much easier. And we know how strong addictions are, you know, and we might have the hundred 
percent best intentions, but you know, then we're tired and had an emotional day and whatever, and then it all just slides away. And yeah, you're right. Um, I mean, having that clean environment can make the difference. Yeah. Last question. Do you like, do you enjoy balsamic vinegar? I sure do. Have you ever had California balsamic? No, I have thought about ordering with your little codes and, you know, or maybe getting some samples or something, but guess what? Every guest that's on the show for the first time gets two free bottles. So right after we log off and I buy Atomic Habits, I'm going to email you and you can choose your two favorite flavors. Oh, thank you so much. I appreciate that. You know that they will be lovingly used. Definitely. Thank you. You are just really a delightful person and such an inspiration. And I just love your story. And thank you for the privilege of being able to share it. Thank you so much for inviting me. I can't even tell you how much it meant to me to be here. It was wonderful. Thank you, Rachel. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back tomorrow when my guest is lifestyle medicine physician, Dr. Wayne Geisinger, was actually my doctor when I lived in the desert. He founded the, uh, was one of the co-founders of the American College of Lifestyle Medicine and brought lifestyle medicine to Loma Linda. And he's going to be talking about the third pillar of healthy nutrition. Take care.